Welcome back to Curious Combinations and Everything's an Original Podcast. I'm AF Tanith, and today I'm covering Archive 81, Episode 1, and Episode 2. I was surprised to hear that Netflix had made a show out of Archive 81. You don't know this about me because I haven't yet said it on the podcast, but I used to be a huge fan of fiction podcasts. There are still some that I enjoy, certainly, but fiction podcasts, particularly horror fiction podcasts, used to be my preferred podcast genre. My first, unsurprisingly, was The Black Tapes. Anyone who got into fiction podcasts circa 2014 or 2015 started with The Black Tapes. Because The Black Tapes was, for a time, far and away both the best and the most popular fiction podcast. It wasn't the first, of course, but it was the one that blew up the most, and it spawned a slew of imitators. It set the standard for the genre, establishing the familiar tropes that Archive 81, the Magnus Archives, the White Vault, and so many more dabbled with and expanded upon. But The Black Tapes only ever put out one good season. There was a noticeable dip in quality when the show came back for its second season, and the third season is pretty universally agreed to be abysmal. The Black Tapes has one of the worst endings of anything I have ever experienced, and I experienced that disappointment in real time after waiting years. Though by the time the episode finally dropped, I was not at all surprised by how bad the ending was. The creators clearly just wanted to be done with the show. The ultimate betrayal of the Black Tapes was visible from miles away. Podcast fiction was, and remains, in a very interesting space. It's a growing medium, and of course that means old media empires inevitably want a chunk of the change. So as the Black Tapes rolled out its seasons, podcasts were starting to disappear, remaining unfinished while rumors of TV adaptations swirled. And there were constant rumors that it was happening behind the scenes of both the Black Tapes and its sister show, Tennis. As for the latter, I have no idea if Tennis ever got either an adaptation or an ending, because Tannis suffered from my most hated cardinal sin of horror fiction podcasting, the lost effect, if you will. Every episode introduced new mysteries, all of them cliche and increasingly disinteresting. Cults, stalkers, shadows, eldritch other realms, imposters, and more mysterious corporations than you could ever hope to count. It was clue after mystery after clue after mystery, and not once was anything ever solved. After two and a half seasons of being strung along, I quit the show, fully aware, especially after the clusterfuck of the Black Tape's non-ending, that this was not actually a story. This was a meandering attempt at one that did not and would not ever have a real conclusion. There was no answer to Tannis's mysteries. And given how often fiction podcasts go unfinished, either because the media companies behind them get disappointed by low profit margins, or because they get swallowed up by deals to maybe someday put the story on TV instead, I really fell off from listening to fiction podcasts. After about the dozenth time I listened to one without an ending and not a hint of any more episodes ever being produced, I largely quit the genre. Though, there are a few that I did and do still listen to, and before I get into my scant experience with Archive 81 as a podcast, I want to mention the stories that I do enjoy. I will include links in the episode description, but for now, these include Kakos Industries, an ongoing comedy podcast about an evil corporation. The Antique Shop, an ongoing fantasy podcast about a shop full of cursed objects. A Voice from Darkness, an ongoing anthology podcast mimicking a call-in radio show. The Cryptonaturalist, a kind of silly but very cozy exploration of a whole host of incredibly creative fictional cryptids. And Wormwood, a long-finished, as in pre-Black Tapes, story about a paranormal investigator searching for a drowned woman. But now, on to Archive 81. I did give this show a try. I listened, I believe, to the first season. I think I may have listened to the entirety of the first season, though if I did, it was long enough ago that I do not largely remember the story. These first two episodes of the adaptation were very familiar to me, ringing many bells in the back of my mind, but I am not in a position to tell you what is going to happen in the rest of the plot right now. I am, I think, in such a position that as I go forward through season one of this show, assuming that it corresponds with season one of the podcast, I may come away from the experience with it unlocking my forgotten memories of the podcast plot, but right now I am more or less in the dark. I think I came to Archive 81 a bit late. As far as I know, what happened was this. The creators made another podcast called The Deep Vault that had a brief moment circa 2017, maybe 2016. I listened to that story and ran into the familiar problem. 
a non-ending with a vague notion that maybe more episodes would be coming someday if there was enough interest. And spoiler alert, there was not, as far as I know. So I don't think I went into Archive 81 feeling the most generous toward the creators, but to the best of my knowledge, I gave it a fair try. Watching these first two episodes did ring a lot of bells for me, like I said. I remember the Visser, I remember the name Melody Pendris, I remember Dan and Mark, and I remember Dan having a little rat friend with him while he worked. If you're interested in my reaction videos for these two episodes, by the way, which are available to all of my $5 patrons, you will know that I also tried to have a rat friend with me while I worked, but Aerith was not overly cooperative, so she's only on camera briefly before I had to put her back in her cage. Like I said, though, I am not wholly sure where we're going with this story, except that I believe Dan's ultimate fate at the end of the season will be to disappear, as I believe his friend Mark is the one investigating Dan's investigation of Melody in the podcast proper. So in the podcast, we have two layers of detachment from Melody herself. There's Melody, then there's Dan, and then there's Mark, and then there's us. As for the rest of the podcast, though, I believe that somewhere in early season two, or else maybe in the wait between seasons, I lost interest. I don't think I listened to any of season two, though perhaps I am misremembering that. Either way, I don't recall being largely won over by the story. I remember feeling very meh about it overall. In my memory, this is a mediocre retread of what the Black Tapes and Tannis tried to do and failed. But who knows? Maybe watching this show will convince me to go back and give the podcast another try. Alternately, maybe the show will do this story such great justice that I will come away from the whole thing with a favorite new tale. Based on these first two episodes, though, I don't have much optimism that that's going to be the case. So far, this really does feel just like another very mediocre retreading of the tropes of the Black Tapes and Tennis, except that the shift in medium here is helping to throw a very stark light on all of the shortcomings of typical podcast writing and storytelling. So, I guess let's just get into this. We open on staticky footage of a woman in distress. They took her, says the woman, and she's referring to someone named Jess. We will see this footage again in the next episode, though it will still be without much context. There is clearly more here than meets the eye. As our credits roll, we get allusions to sound waves, old video, surveillance, hidden identity, cults and occult symbols, and creatures either supernatural, extraterrestrial, or extra-dimensional. I will talk a bit more about the creature we catch a glimpse of here in the future, because I honestly cannot take it seriously for what I hope is a reason you will find as amusing as I do. But for now, they're kind of fun credits, and they're fairly intriguing. After the credits, we are introduced to our main character, Dan. He is a New Yorker with a penchant for old videotape, as evidenced by his introductory scene of buying old VHS tapes. I find this deeply silly because, and I am not joking as I say this, it is not possible to even so much as give away a tape collection in 2022. Truly, I have been trying to give my old VHS tapes away for years now, and no one wants them, and I have just slowly started throwing them away. Donation places won't even take them anymore. Not a single living soul wants VHS tapes anymore, and I think it's hilarious that the show introduces us to the concept of Dan working as a tape restoration expert by showing him buy second-hand VHS tapes. Like, we get it. He's good at fixing them, but why is he buying them? Especially at $5 a pop. I repeat, you cannot even give these damn things away for free. But... During the conversation with the VHS salesman, we get an allusion to a Jill, presumably an ex-girlfriend of Dan's. Nothing much comes of that within these two episodes, and I have no idea if it will at all be important. It could be related to this supposed breakdown he had recently, or it could be a way to justify his initial interest in Melody's tapes. Or it could just be a minor detail that doesn't have much bearing on the plot at all. Either way, we see Dan working on restoring tapes here, and I've gotta admit, I can't imagine that restoring old tape is either as quick, as easy, or anywhere near as successful as this show makes it look. Like, the restored footage we see of tapes pulled from melted and smashed cases is like, pretty much perfect VHS quality in a lot of cases. It's really pretty ridiculous, and he only seems to work a minute or two to get the tapes up and running. All I'm saying is that maybe they should have done a little bit more work to show the restoration process accurately, since that's what this medium offers over pure audio storytelling. In a TV show, unlike in a podcast, we can see what Dan is doing, so why not try to show us how labor-intensive this process actually is? Because I'm sure it is. Otherwise, the viewer just gets the feeling that Dan sits down to work for like 5 minutes per day and then spends the next 23 hours and 55 minutes dicking around. 
Anyway, the first thing that Dan restores is an old reel of footage that he claims is a film from the 50s. I doubt this is a real movie that we're seeing here, though, given the overlap that appears to exist between what this film portrays and what we will see in the rest of the story. That symbol from the credits, those masks, they're in this movie with a woman being ritualistically murdered on screen. Will this turn out to be a real snuff film? Maybe something Dan remembers from his childhood because his father was somehow related to this cult? You've got to wonder. What Dan has to say about it is that the director's daughter found this unreleased original footage in her father's things and that Dan is restoring it to, quote, give Evie a little piece of her father back. Given what we soon learn about Dan's own father in regards to whatever happened with Melody and the Visser, this feels like a very important line indeed. After this little bit, Dan receives a mysterious high 8 tape from someone named Karen. He restores it to find footage of two women. Roommates, we'll learn, and there's a joke in there. I will be back before you even miss me, says the one who will soon be moving into the Visser. This prompts her friend to make a crack about Amelia Earhart, but that is hardly necessary. The first woman, Melody, her line is so deliberately ironic that it should be unmistakable for anyone in the audience. Melody will not be back. Melody will never be back, as Dan's research immediately shows us. The Visser burned down, leaving a slew of people unaccounted for, with the implication, perhaps correct, perhaps incorrect, given what we learn at the end of the next episode, that Melody is among this number. And then we're on to our next character. This is Mark, the man who in the podcast is the true audience stand-in. In the podcast, as I said, we have layers to this. Dan was looking into Melody's tapes to find out what happened to Melody. But the podcast, such as it exists, is Mark looking into Dan's tapes about his investigation into Melody's tapes to find out what happened to both of them. And in this adaptation, Mark is indeed a podcaster, except that he's a podcaster unlike almost any other. It appears that he's doing live audio theater, or else that he's doing a live show with onstage Foley work. Whatever he's doing, I have only ever heard or heard of a single podcast in this vein, that being Fireside Mystery Theater, which I will also link in the show notes. And I do recommend checking that out if you're interested in horror or macabre audio fiction. I listened to that show for years, and don't be surprised if I pick their RSS feed back up at some point in the future. They are good at what they do, and it's pretty much what Mark is doing here. But given that most amateur podcasting is just some jackass talking into a mic in their bedroom, and I say this as a jackass currently talking into a mic in my bedroom, I find this portrayal of podcasting to be pretty indicative of what more traditional forms of media must think that the podcasting medium is. And that is very funny. And the audio play that Mark appears to be putting on here is a big hint, I think, of what may have happened to Melody, and possibly to Dan by the end of the season. But in any case, Mark and Dan catch up after the show. According to Mark, Dan is a skeptic, but also a person who is fundamentally paranoid and has struggled in the past with believing that he's being watched. It's an interesting character beat, and I won't go so far yet as to say that I feel it's a misstep, though I may say so in the future, given Dan's choices over the course of this episode and the next. Because once he gets involved with Davenport, he seems to both know that he's being watched and not really have much of a problem with it. It is quite strange, and it's part of a larger problem that I have with a majority of the characterization throughout these first two episodes, but we're gonna get there. After speaking with Karen about the footage she had him repair, she tells him that it's nothing to do with his usual museum job. It was a favor for a donor, and she tells him that the donor in question wants to meet with him. He tries to research this Mr. Davenport and the company that Davenport works for, LMG, but there is no information available online. Davenport claims that there is also very little information about Dan out there on the internet, too. Now, mysterious corporations involved with mysterious cults is a huge trope in Pacific Northwest Stories podcasts and their derivatives, and it was one of the things I found the most infinitely mockable about Tannis in particular. So I can't say I was pleased to see that trope pop up here, but I have no complaints just yet. As always, I am going to keep an open mind until presented with damning evidence. In any case, Davenport offers Dan a job. It's going to be a footage restoration gig up in the Catskill Mountains in New York, so he won't be terribly far away from his normal city life, but he won't exactly be in his normal world, if you know what I mean. Rather, he'll be out there alone and pretty much cut off from civilization to a certain extent. No other people for miles, no internet connection, and no cell signal. The only way to contact anyone will be a landline, and we all know how reliable those are in an emergency situation. Unless you're Gen Z, I guess, in which case I'll just say that they're not. Lines can go down, lines can get cut, receivers and cradles can get smashed, and you have to actually be able to reach the phone if something goes wrong. But the thing that upsets Dan during this conversation with Davenport is nothing to do with the specifications of the job. Not really. It's that Davenport tries to lure him in with an emotional connection. Davenport wants to know as much as possible about the Visser fire, and surely Dan gets that, given what happened in his childhood. 
Except Dan doesn't think that information is publicly available. So how the hell does Davenport know about the fire at his childhood home that presumably killed his father and sister? It may have killed his mother too, but we haven't seen her on screen yet. Her identity remains a mystery right now, so we'll see where that goes. Now, while Dan freaks out about this apparent information leak, we get our first hints of flashback. It's a dream that Dan is having, a tangled mess of imagery that we don't yet know how to parse. Dan walking his dog as a little boy, a metronome, Dan's sister playing the piano, a look of horror on Dan's face, and the footage we saw of Melody and her roommate. When Dan wakes, he jumps to a truly wild conclusion. He combs through the footage of Melody and her friend Annabelle, and he sees upon her mirror a photo of her with a dog. It is a very common dog, some kind of a golden retriever or a yellow lab or something like that. A dog that is virtually identical to millions of other dogs in America. But Dan is suddenly convinced that it is his childhood dog. And if I were his friend, I would be very concerned about his mental health right now. While I'm sure that from a storytelling perspective, it's going to turn out that he's right about this dog's identity, right now, Dan just sounds like he is descending into delusions. It's his dog because it's wearing a red collar? Seriously? There must be thousands of Goldens in America wearing red collars at any given moment, and that's not even counting all the other dogs who look vaguely like this one but aren't the exact same breed. Not to mention, of course, that this is grainy old restored VHS footage. It's patently ridiculous that Dan thinks this is his dog, and it's even more ridiculous that I am all but sure the show will eventually reveal to us that this is indeed his dog, given the connection that seems to exist between Melody and Dan's father. So... Did Dan's father do something to Melody and keep her dog? Was Melody posing with Dan's father's dog because she was Dan's father's lover? Is there any hint of a chance that Melody could be Dan's mom? I don't think the timeline matches up very well, given that Melody goes missing in 1994, seemingly without ever having had any children, and that Dan doesn't look like he could have possibly been born after 1990, and that there's no hint of a resemblance between him and her. But I guess it's possible? We'll see. Anyway, Dan takes the job. He heads out to the Catskills with Mr. Davenport, and I think it's an atrocious idea. He's going to be living out in this horrific cement building out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by fences very purposefully designed to keep trespassers out. Or, worse, prisoners in. Davenport claims that this place was purchased to be a research facility, but I find that a rather suspect claim. Not to mention how suspicious it is that there's an entire walled-off section of the building that Dan is not allowed to enter but we're not there quite yet. Davenport is more or less friendly as they tour the place, but he makes a less than subtle allusion to Dan's mental health struggles before he leaves, and it is tense to say the least. There are medical professionals less than 20 minutes away, including psychiatric help, says Davenport, and he gives Dan what amounts to a wrist-mounted life alert button. One hopes that this is the Chekhov's gun we're establishing here, and that the point of this scene is at least a little bit more nuanced than invoking our culture's ever-present ableism as a way to justify the possibility of exploring an unreliable narrator. So, with Davenport gone, Dan gets to work. His first tape opens with Melody approaching the Visser for the first time. That symbol that was in the circle, the film that Dan was fixing up earlier? Yeah, it's part of the decorations on the building exterior, which definitely isn't ominous at all. As Melody approaches the building, we see what's going to become a familiar face. Her not-quite-love interest from the next episode holds the door open for her, but she's not ready to come in just yet. One wonders if that too is symbolism. And though Melody mentions the building having been built on the ruins of a mansion that burned down in the 20s, which is itself suspicious, and also notes how strange the carved symbol is, Dan does not appear to recognize it as something he just saw in the circle a few days ago. Why? Who knows? In reality, I would say that he simply forgot, but reality is no justification for fiction. Reality is often unbelievable, but fiction must be more convincing than that. Am I really supposed to believe that Dan simply forgot about the symbol? That seeing it here prompted no recollection in his mind? Or is there something else going on in his memories, something preventing him from putting the pieces together or from growing as suspicious as he ought? Given how idiotic most of the rest of his and Melody's decisions are over the course of this episode and the next, I rather do think it's just bad writing. But I suppose we will find out if there is more to it than that. In the meantime, though, Melody is moving into her new apartment in the Visser, and she is not making a phenomenal first impression. She is not remotely worried by how the previous tenant left some of their stuff there and just agrees to keep it for herself, which strikes me as ridiculous because A, I don't want some stranger's stuff being dumped on me without my consent, and B, I've got to wonder what happened to that tenant anyway. Where did they go? Why is their stuff still here? And why doesn't maintenance want Melody to go to the sixth floor? 
But back to what I was saying about Melody making a piss poor impression on the rest of the tenants. She is being weird and invasive, making a crack about the maintenance man's name, banging on people's doors, practically shouting her whole life story in the hallway when no one answers her, and fully planning to shove a camera in the face of anyone who actually does bother opening up. Me personally, I would never open my door to this woman. First of all, get your camera away from me and my house, and second of all, I don't know what the laws are in New York, but where I live, it is illegal to record someone without getting their consent. Honestly, it's a pretty awful first impression of Melody for me to forget what any of the other tenants think about her. But that night, after settling down to go to bed, Melody is roused by the sound of chanting coming from her vents. Because this is kind of, sort of, a found footage series, she grabs her camera to investigate, and that's something I know a lot of people hate about found footage. What's with the cameras all the time? At least in Paranormal Activity, they were actually trying to catch a ghost on film. Here, though, Melody is just kind of being a weirdo, and by the way, won't using this much tape in 1994 be really, really expensive? Anyway, when the weird chanting stops, Melody is just on her knees on the floor, repeating hello into her vents. And then Dan, watching the tape 30 years later, slaps his hands over his ears because of a horrible feedback noise that blares from his system. One has to wonder if perhaps it's some kind of an otherworldly voice, if perhaps we're dealing with a cult worshipping or summoning something that is communicating with them in some way that is captured on tape as this awful shriek. If nothing else, that little church group we see in the next episode is definitely not worshipping a cross, that much is for sure. In the meantime, though, we are on to the next bit of tape. It is day two of Melody's life at the Visser, March 12, 1994, and she attempts to bother each and every single one of her neighbors with an enormous smile on her face. The fuck off that I would give this woman if she showed up at my door like this, I swear. But upon finally catching sight of someone in the halls, Melody follows this person. And that turns out to be a little girl. Her name, she claims, is Jess, and she's kind of a jack-of-all-trades for the tenants. She delivers stuff, she takes out trash, walks dogs, and plenty more. She says she's lived there since she was born, and so Melody asks this little girl to help her poke her nose into everyone's business. It is absolutely not appropriate behavior, but at least the kid is getting some cash out of the ordeal, I guess? First up is a composer, Tamara, working on an experimental opera called Purgatory that she says is about a descent into a shadow world. It's very unsound from the black tapes, which was originally introduced as a sound that if you heard it would kill you within a year, before eventually evolving into an inherent ingredient in an orchestral piece that, if played, would both end the world and bring forth, quote, shadows emerging from shadows. It was a bit of the black tapes that I really adored and that went utterly nowhere, and so I hope that this very similar idea actually gets done justice here. If not, I will probably eventually write something to do with this idea myself. As Tamara plays her music and goes a bit trance-like, though, Melody begins having a very different experience. It's almost like a panic attack, or perhaps the music is making her physically sick. Either way, Tamara says that when the music is played in her shows, the actors will all be wearing blank white masks, very reminiscent of what we saw being worn in The Circle. There's zero chance that the two are not connected, and I hope that whatever the connection turns out to be, it's going to prove narratively satisfying, or at least sufficiently creepy to keep me entertained. After watching the tape, Dan calls Mark to try to get him to look into Tamara. Though he didn't seem to recognize the symbol on the viscer, he did recognize the music that Tamara had composed. It's possible that it was present in the circle too, I'm not sure, I didn't notice, but Dan seems to think that it was something he heard in his childhood, and as we will see in subsequent flashbacks, he does seem to be right on that front. If the flashbacks are to be believed, that is. Dan's call to Mark, though, gets cut off, and the clicking on the line hints at someone listening. So off Dan goes into the woods to search for a cell signal. He hits the fence before he finds one, and gives up for now. He will find one later, though, but he won't be alone. When he heads back inside, he gets a call from Mr. Davenport, and it's here that I caught for the first time that Mr. Davenport's first name is Virgil. I suspect, of course, that this is meaningful. We seem to be dealing with something otherworldly here. The statue that we'll see later is either vaguely alien-like or vaguely demonic. There's definitely a cult, and Tamara's music is about, quote, a descent into a shadow world. So one has to guess that Virgil is a very purposefully chosen name. It's not exactly commonplace, after all, and most American minds will most likely associate the name Virgil with Dante's The Divine Comedy, which, for the uninformed, is basically biblical historical self-insert fanfiction, in which Dante gets to tour hell, purgatory, and heaven, while for a time hanging out with his favorite ancient Roman poet, 
Virgil. Virgil accompanies Dante through all of Hell and most of Purgatory, and one assumes this hints at Virgil Davenport's role in Dan's, Dante's, Dante Dan, his story. Is Dan about to enter Hell and or Purgatory, either metaphorically or quasi-literally? Is Davenport going to be the one to guide him on his journey? Between Tamara's opera and Davenport and Dan's names, it certainly seems as if that might be the case. At an enormous wall of shelves in the building, though, Dan finds a copy of an old movie called Solaris, and I apologize, I am not familiar at all with this movie, though I do believe it's real, and he has himself a little movie night. But before that, he finds what looks like a handwritten novel among the rest of the books, though perhaps it's actually a diary of some kind? We don't know yet. What we do know is what happens with what he finds after the movie. He goes to the kitchen and is horrified to discover that there is a rat in the kitchen of this seemingly abandoned old building, and I really don't know why he's surprised, unless he can also tell, as I can, that this is not a wild rat. That little cutie is a domesticated rat, occasionally being replaced by a CGI rat. And it is utterly adorable. Seriously, if you are ever curious about domesticated rats, and you should be, head on over to YouTube and look up Shadow the Rat. That channel is run by a woman who's got a slew of pet rats that she teaches some of the most adorable and interesting tricks. Obstacle courses, scent work, paw paintings, putting tiny little basketballs through tiny little hoops. It is the cutest shit you will ever see. And if you live in a place where you can only have small pets instead of cats or dogs, I cannot more highly recommend getting a little trio of rats in a suitably large cage. They are such awesome little creatures, and mine are named Poppy and Aerith. But that's enough gushing for now. Dan lacks a healthy appreciation for rats, as do most people, admittedly, and so out comes the rat trap. Thankfully, he will later choose to spare his new friend, but seeing that little baby with its tail caught in the trap was horrifying. I don't want to see that shit any more than I want to see a dog or a fox caught in a bear trap or something like that. It's just awful. Anyway, it's flashback time again. Dan is dreaming once more, and this time we get to see some more of the piano scene. He's with his sister, and they're playing tomorrow's song when their father comes in the room, very upset at the sound of it. But before we can see any more, Dan is awoken by rodent squeaks in distress. The rat has been caught, and it is clearly toying with the idea of chewing off its own tail to get away. And of course, that may be more foreshadowing. Thankfully, Dan takes mercy on the little cutie pie, though, and sets him free and helps him recover. Then we're back to the tapes. Melody is interviewing Jess, and it's here that we find out that Jess was born in the building. Jess asks if Melody thinks it's bad luck to have been born in the building, and why does Melody want to know about the viscera in the first place? The second of which is a good question. Not really the first. She tells Jess about the mansion that used to be on the property and that it burned down, and then she says that she mostly just wants to find out why people choose to live here, which is a batshit crazy explanation. Just makes you sound nosy as all hell. But Jess has an answer. Her expression is suddenly grave, and she says, because they're pulled here. And then she asks about someone named Samuel. But Melody does not know any Samuel, not yet, and Jess begins to have some sort of a seizure at this point. On the one hand, I wonder if she's being punished for asking Melody these questions, or perhaps for mentioning Samuel. And on the other hand, if there's something supernatural going on here, I would assume that Jess's being born in the building would mark her as somehow special. To that point, we hear a distorted voice on the tape calling Jess's name, followed by a glimpse of the weird monstrosity from the opening credits. But then we're on to other things. Namely, we are on to Dan running through the woods in search of a signal. He finally finds one and gets to talk to Mark. Mark, though previously worried about his friend's mental health and paranoia, immediately believes Dan's claims about the landline being monitored. Dan, though, cannot bring himself to articulate what it is that actually made him call. He admits that he thinks he's starting to lose his grip on reality, and Mark makes a really shitty joke about The Shining that confirms that he is not, in fact, the friend you want to go to if you're having mental health issues, much though he would like you to think otherwise. As for the research he asked him to do into Tamara, there's nothing. If Tamara ever really existed, neither she nor her work have any presence online. So Dan tells Mark to look into LMG and Melody Pendris, and then he uses the blue string from his hoodie to mark the spot where his cell finally got a signal. But while he does this, someone is watching him. Someone in a red hoodie. I doubt that it's Virgil, but could it be someone related to the Visser? Could it be Melody? Jess? My pet theory, complete tinfoil at this point, is that it is somehow Dan himself. But that's just because I've been on a three-week binge of dark, so my head is still all caught up in notions of time travel and spying on your own past self. 
I am probably barking up the wrong tree with that thought, but we do see Dan wearing a red hoodie of his own in the very next scene, so maybe I'm not. Anyway, though, back to the flashbacks. We pick up right where we left off. Dan's dad is demanding to know what his kids are playing on the piano, and they don't actually have any information. They heard it on a tape, but they don't know what it is, and when he tells them to stop playing it, they only momentarily do. The man tells Dan to take the dog, Cleo, for a walk, and there's definitely the implication here that this is the only reason Dan survived, that his sister went back to playing that song on the piano while he was out, and that somehow this caused the fire. Whether or not that theory is true, though, I have no idea yet. But there's definitely something going on here with Melody, Dan's father, all of these fires, and Tamara's song. It could not be more obvious that everything is connected, all the way from the mansion that burned down, to Dan's childhood trauma, to the mysterious monster on the tape, to that spooky song. I just hope the rat's not involved. Back on the tapes, though, Jess has recovered from her seizure. Melody asks about talking to Jess's mom, and Jess's consistent dodging of the mom-related questions makes me think that either Jess's mom isn't alive, or that something even bigger than that is going on with Jess. According to her, she's been to doctors that keep telling her there's nothing wrong with her, no real reason for her seizures, and she alludes to seeing things while she's seizing that her mom wants her to talk to a priest about. That is ominous to say the least, especially when she refuses to clarify for either Melody or the audience's sake. At this point, Melody asks about Samuel, and again, Jess dodges. Instead, Jess asks if Melody believes in another world, not a heaven or a hell, a world, quote, like this one, she says, but somehow, quote, more than this world. I have no idea what the hell that's supposed to mean, and Melody's similar reaction prompts Jess to pull back. She has clearly internalized the notion that she is some kind of a freak. Apparently, the other kids at school bully her. But then comes the weirdest question yet. Do you think I could be more than I am? She asks. Do I seem strong enough to hold a new world inside of me? To which I say, what? It reminds me of this obscure fantasy novel I read once as a kid and then again as an adult to see if I'd like it any better. Spoiler alert, I didn't. It's called A School for Sorcery, and I remember literally nothing about it except that it was A, extremely confusing, and B, that it ends with one of the characters being given the task of trying to keep their own little universe alive. As in, they are a powerful enough sorcerer to create a tiny universe that can be contained in the palm of their hand, and if they take their attention away from it for any moment, it will be destroyed, and part of their school assignment is to keep it alive as long as possible. The implications there are certainly something, and it's all I can think of when I hear Jess's line here. Well, that and the whole thing with the cat in Men in Black 2. But given the allusions to Purgatorio, I assume that there's something a bit more sinister happening here, especially when we return to the tape. Can I tell you something? Jess asks, and then the tape jumps. Suddenly, we are on an entirely different scene. Jess is nowhere to be found, and Melody is in a panic. She says Jess was taken, though she doesn't say by who, and then the maintenance man is there again to tell her to stay away from the sixth floor. He doesn't appear to know what she's talking about, and it does genuinely seem as if Melody is having some kind of a paranoid breakdown. She runs down the stairs and comes across a man who will briefly be her love interest in the next episode, and he tells her that, quote, Jess is gone. She just tells him to go fuck himself, and then there is... someone... It is two unidentified men who know Melody's name and come bearing the implication that they're going to take her away to a psych facility of some kind, especially given that they're with Dan's father, a psychiatrist. But Dan is horrified to see his father in this tape. Only in this moment has he realized that his father is involved. As Dan has a panic attack of his own, the IRL camera pulls out to reveal that Dan is on camera in Universe 2. Davenport is watching him, along with what appears to be every other inch of the rest of the building, too. And then we're on to the next episode. What a Wonderful World plays over a fake commercial for a DNA testing kit, and while it comes into play in this episode, one imagines it's going to have some even greater significance later in the series. Given the connection between Melody and Dan's father, I have to wonder if this is meant to be a clue that Melody and Dan are related biologically. Like I said before, I don't really think that makes a terrible amount of sense, but I don't know what else to think right now. Either way, Dan is off to the woods again for another panicky phone call to Mark. He tells Mark that the men who took Melody away worked for Rockland, a psychiatric facility that Dan didn't even know his father had ever worked at, for, or with. He does, though, now know that Davenport is a liar, 
And Mark's advice here is horrible. It goes completely against all common sense. He's telling Dan to stay in the thick of potential danger instead of getting the hell out of Dodge. And more importantly, it doesn't really jive with what I had thought of Mark before now. Mark was just trying to tell him not to go in the last episode, and now Dan knows something big and possibly threatening is going on. And now Mark is trying to talk him into staying? It just doesn't really make any sense to me, and it's the first big chip in my suspension of disbelief when it comes to these characters and the decisions they make. Both Dan and Melody are going to consistently put themselves in danger over the course of this episode for very little logical reason or payoff. As episode 2 rolls on, I find them both pretty equally ridiculous and dumb. Neither of them seems to have any self-preservation instinct at all. Either way, though, Dan invites Mark to his aunt's house. Apparently, she is currently out of the country, so the place is empty, and if Dan shows up there, he will be able to go through Dan's dad's old documents to search for clues while Dan goes through the tapes. I find it a bit hard to believe that this dude who can't even be fucked to call Dan back would actually pick up his whole life and move into Dan's aunt's house to help him with this nonsense, but sure. Okay, I guess. But Mark is increasingly suspicious to me here. He asks if Melody knew Dan's father, and... I don't know, it just seems like a jump, possibly one that means Mark knows more than he's letting on. But back to 1994. Melly and Jess are out shopping, which I've gotta reiterate is just not appropriate. When they run into Jess's priest, Jess even introduces Melody as her friend, not her neighbor, her friend. And spoiler alert for the kids in the audience, adults don't want to be your friend. And that's not a judgment call. It's not me being mean or insulting you. But the first rule of safety for children and teens when it comes to adults is that adults are not your peers. An adult who tries to act like your peer is inherently suspicious. Adults don't want to be your friend, or they shouldn't at least, and adults do not and should not need your help. An adult that wants to be your friend is suspicious, really suspicious, and you should tell your parents. An adult that needs you to give them directions or help them find their lost dog or anything like that is suspicious and you should tell your parents. Stranger Danger, yes, is a wildly overblown concern when it comes to kids' safety, but that doesn't mean any random stranger is not a potential danger. And if they want something from you that's even slightly verging on inappropriate, they are a possible threat. Again, adults don't want to be friends with children. But back to the show. Jess stops to talk to a Miss Wall, who promptly gives Melody what I suppose could pass for a kiss on each cheek, except that it looks a whole hell of a lot more like a cat trying to rub its scent off on you. And she doesn't even say a word to Melody while she does it. Nor does Melody really respond in any way. Like, she's not even surprised that this random old lady rubs their faces together. It is the weirdest shit I've ever seen. But then we're on to a less frightening neighbor. It is Donna Maria from Kimmy Schmidt, except here her name is Beatrice. She apparently inherited her fish from the predecessor in her apartment, which strikes no one in universe as suspicious, but is definitely the start of what feels like an emerging pattern. And then she offers to read Melody's tarot while gossiping about what she suspects is a sex cult operating in the building. Given what we see of the various weirdos later, I'm not entirely convinced that she's wrong. Melody, though, gets a very predictable tarot. Her final card, the card representing her future, is the death card, and like every tarot reader ever, Beatrice is quick to point out that it is not meant to be taken literally. She does not, though, explain what the death card actually means. She doesn't explain that it is meant to represent major life changes, spiritual transformation, and new beginnings. And so the audience is kind of left with the implication that, yes, Melody is probably going to die. And it's here, by the way, that I think I finally figured out who Melody's actress reminds me of. There's a little bit of Shannon Sossaman in there, but it's also a healthy dose of Sarah Paulson. Let me know if you see it. But before we move on from the tarot, let us quickly look at the other two cards. Death is so ominous that you almost forget about the other two, but I feel they are important foreshadowing. The past card hints at pain and grief in Melody's life, and we've no real knowledge yet what that could be, save what we learn about her uncertain parentage. As for the present, Beatrice thinks a person has led Melody here, and while Melody thinks that Beatrice has struck upon the truth about her search for Julia Bennett, that Melody is here looking for her long-lost bio mom at her last known address, I have to wonder if there might be more to it than that. Did someone in the cult lure Melody in? Maybe her brief love interest? Or Dan's father? Or Virgil, somehow? It's definitely something to keep an eye on, I think. In any case, Beatrice gives Melody her best clue to her mother. There's a seemingly abandoned apartment on the fourth floor that keeps getting mail even though no one has seen the occupant in years. It could be Julia Bennett, if she's still there. 
Cut to Melody, nosy brat that she is, trying to steal the mail from apartment 4G. Her almost love interest makes his proper entrance here, pointing out that what she's doing at the moment is attempting to commit a felony. It's a really not cute meet cute, and though her faux charming love interest introduces himself here as Samuel, Melody has apparently already forgotten where she has heard that name recently. Just like Dan failed to recognize the symbol from the circle on the building. What I'm saying is that Dan and Melody are a couple of dum-dums. If they turn out to be related, I'm going to assume it's a family trait. But then we're on to awkward flirting. Samuel invites Melody to Tamara's opera, which is awkward given what we see later. As far as I can tell, Samuel is trying to lure Melody into something, maybe danger, maybe the cult, who knows, by insulting his girlfriend's creative work and then cheating on her. It is not a good look. But who knows, maybe they're part of a hive mind or something and it's not cheating at all. I guess we'll find out. Anyway, Melody gets a call from Dan's dad, talking about how they didn't end on a good note and he is worried about her. And I don't know if Melody was ever actually his patient, but it certainly sounds like she was his lover. Or maybe that he stalked her? That's possible too, I guess. Maybe even probable, given that Dr. Turner here seems to think that asking his ex's or his ex-patient's roommate for her current address is acceptable behavior. And given that Annabelle did indeed give Dan's dad that information, one wonders if Melody has anyone in her life that doesn't tap dance all over her boundaries. Get yourself some boundaries, girl, and enforce them. Out in the woods, back in present day, Dan stumbles across some kind of an auxiliary building. He tries the door, which doesn't budge, and then he tries to see if he can see anything through the peephole. Except this door doesn't have a peephole, so this is a grown man trying to peer through a solid object with sheer force of will, and I laughed my ass off. I hope this is a clue to something, or else it is the single funniest and most bizarre mistake I have ever caught in a show. So... Dan climbs to the roof to try to get a signal from the new height, and Dan asks Mark, once he has gotten through, to check if his dad's files have any info on Melody because apparently they did really know each other. More importantly though, Dan turns around to see a figure in the red jacket spying on him. And when he calls out to the stranger, the person very adorably jogs off into the woods. Seriously, it's the silliest and least threatening thing I've ever seen in my life. For the second time in as many minutes, I laughed. Try though Dan might to catch the stranger though, the person gets away. He, she, or they disappear somewhere around the fence, so I've gotta ask, are we dealing with a ghost, a secret passage, or maybe a hallucination here? When he heads back to the facility, Dan calls after Mr. Davenport, except Virgil is, quote, in the field, and Dan has no more idea than I do what the hell that means. Initially, this conjured up for me thoughts of Tannis and Annihilation and exploring dangerous eldritch worlds unknown, but perhaps it's much more simple than that. Virgil shows up pretty much at the drop of a hat later, so maybe when this receptionist says that Davenport's in the field, maybe that simply means he's keeping a close watch on Dan from somewhere nearby. And then there's the rat again. The little buddy is as cute as ever, and honestly, the rat could just be the whole show for me. Just give me the rat show. That's all I need. But Dan would rather watch something else. The Secret of Nim, in fact, which I think also might be thematic. For those uninformed, The Secret of Nim is a 1982 Don Bluth movie based on a trilogy of children's books, the first of which is titled Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. I won't get into the bulk of the story here, but it deals heavily with lab rats who escaped from the titular Nim, that being an acronym for the National Institute of Mental Health. Given our conspiracy somehow involving Rockland and Dan's father, I would say that The Secret of Nim is a very telling choice for this story to make indeed. But what exactly is it telling us? Regardless, we now get a hint of an answer on the identity of the person in the red hoodie. It is Dan's dad. Or so Dan dreams. This paternal specter speaks without a voice, then turns and leads Dan through the building, until it seems to transform around him into the viscer itself, and Dan knocks on an apartment door. It's apartment 2D, Melody's, and she meets him face to face the moment before he wakes. Given that we later see the scene on the tapes, with Melody answering her door only to find no one there, we are left with only two options that I can see. Either Dan has actually seen these tapes before, and his dream is based on the unconscious memory of what he's going to be viewing shortly, or that was a real experience the two of them somehow had across the span of time. I don't know which theory the story wants me to believe just yet, but I think I know which one I prefer, and I certainly know which would be true in reality. At the opera, Tamara only laughs when Melody says that Samuel invited her, 
It is ominous, given what I think of their motives and potential inhumanity, but perhaps there's something else going on here. Perhaps Samuel inviting another woman to her opera means something else for Tamara's relationship with him. In any case, Melody asks for a beer, and her acting here has to be seen to be believed. She asks for a beer and pronounces the word Budweiser like it's her literal first day on the planet Earth, and that I don't think is supposed to be a hint of anything. I think it's just an atrocious line reading that I cannot believe the showrunners left in but here's hoping I eat my words. As for the opera itself, well, it's something the hell else. I'm not sure what the audience is supposed to be feeling here. I don't know if I'm supposed to find this creepy or if the show kind of wants me to think Tamara is a weirdo, but like, I don't know. So far, she seems like the most interesting character. I love that she's creative in this way. I think her art is fucking bizarre, but I love that she loves it. And where can I get that bracelet she's wearing, by the way? Melody, of course, does not agree with me, and Samuel claims not to either. Given that he and Tamara seem in some way to be together, I hope his shittiness toward her art is like a part of a con to lure in Melody, because otherwise, you gotta break up with him, girl. Forget the question of whether he's a cheater or this relationship is open. If he can't support your weird creative hobbies, he's just not worth it. But Samuel claims that he teaches Renaissance and medieval studies at a college, and there's a hint of a mystery around his financial situation. Then we're on to a discussion of Melody's camera. It was given to her some time ago by her mother, who died two years ago, and despite the fact that this camera is at least two years old already in 1994, I guarantee that this model was produced no earlier than, I don't know, 1998? Like, I remember 90s camcorders. Maybe I was just too poor to see one like this until the new millennium, but I definitely don't remember anything like this being around when I was tiny. Anyway, Melody essentially snitches on Beatrice here. She tells Samuel that Beatrice thinks there's a sex cult being run out of the building, and I've gotta say that if Melody telling him this gets Beatrice killed, I'm gonna be pissed. So far, I think Beatrice might be my favorite character insofar as we're talking about humans. If non-humans are on the table, of course, it's the rat. Obviously, it's the rat. But back to Samuel. According to him, Beatrice probably actually heard the Visser Historical Society, which is a made-up nonsense organization, if I have ever heard one. He tells Melody that he gave them a talk about Dutch witchcraft surviving into the 20th century in Lower Manhattan, and Melody's reaction is pretty telling, I would say. Whether or not this is strictly true, I dare say this is a hint. We're doing something with witches, right? In any case, I'm really not enjoying this little relationship that's happening here. I don't really see any chemistry between the two actors, and the actor playing Samuel is doing such a good job being just shy of attractive thanks to an undercurrent of really well-portrayed creepiness. Something is decidedly off about this guy, even before we see hints of some kind of fuckery later, and I just don't know what to make of this dude. So, after getting a skeleton key off of Samuel, Melody tries to go steal the missing tenant's mail, except that the mailbox has already been emptied. Jess, who appears out of nowhere, tells her that no one lives in that apartment that goes with the mailbox, that no one has lived there, in fact, for at least a decade and a half. And if Jess had to guess where all the mail went, well, the maintenance guy probably threw it away. Oh, and there's someone waiting for Melody in her apartment. A woman was running around, banging on doors, looking for Melody, and Jess let her in to Melody's apartment, which is why you don't make friends with children. Lucky for Melody, though, and unfortunately for me, it's Annabelle, not someone more dangerous. If I thought Melody was kind of annoying, she has got nothing on Annabelle. As she announces in a minute, it is 2 o'clock in the morning currently, but Annabelle greets Melody with a full-on shriek. And you know, a building built in the 30s is going to have trash-ass soundproofing. Like, if you can hear music coming through the vents, everyone can hear your shitty friend screaming. Shut her the fuck up. Signed, a person who lives in a very loud building. Anyway, Annabelle is here with her anachronistic as hell Kim Kardashian voice to needle Melody about her date and run Samuel off, which could turn out to have been a good deed in the long run, but in the meantime, all I could really say was good for him. Establish those boundaries, baby, because with Annabelle around, you're really gonna need them. As demonstrated by what she says to Melody when Melody asks why Annabelle gave Dr. Turner her number. Annabelle's answer is literally just, because he asked, and then she's into an invasive game of 20 questions. Like, did Melody fuck her therapist? Is she pregnant with his kid? Is this her secret hideaway until she has the baby? It is gross, is rude, and it is a serious problem. It's not like Annabelle doesn't know that Dan's dad was Melody's therapist. She explicitly states it. If there was a relationship between them, it was inherently coercive and creepy and vile. That's not a joke. It's not outright criminal, no, and maybe it should be, but it is a serious breach of ethics that would get his license to practice taken away. 
I guess my point is that Annabelle sucks, and Samuel's single most attractive moment is when he successfully extracts himself from that situation with just the right level of implicit judgment, and if I were Melody, I'd have thrown Annabelle out on her ass. But back to Dan. After a quick hello to Ratty, he is on to breakfast, or he would be if he hadn't noticed the hollow wall behind the pantry. With an enormous wrench in hand, he breaks through the drywall and slips into the tunnel it reveals. Honestly, I think it's a pretty stupid move. There is nothing inherently shifty about a walled-off portion of an old building like this. It might be walled off for safety reasons. Maybe there's asbestos in there or something. But Dan doesn't think about any of that. Instead, he goes poking around to see if he can get into any of the rooms off the secret hallway, and though he can't, he does manage to end up in what looks like some kind of an old abandoned church. Carved into the furniture are the initials TB plus AF, and I have no idea who they are yet, but I'm sure we'll find out. In the meantime, though, Virgil has arrived. What is he doing here? How did he get here? Why isn't Dan frightened or wary or intimidated to see him so unexpectedly? These are all good questions with no good answers. They have a weird little conversation about Christianity and Jesus here. Virgil recounts a story of a debate he once held in which he argued that Jesus was a demon who almost brought about the end of humankind, and I don't know what to make of that. Whatever is happening in that cult, it is clearly not Christianity, so is this meant to be a hint that Virgil is part of the cult? Either way, I'm much more interested in how Virgil managed to get here so quickly. He must be monitoring Dan from fairly close by, right? And that's really ominous, though Dan doesn't seem to realize it. As far as I can tell, he does not for a single moment think to question how Virgil rolled up on him so quickly. Again, I find a lot of what he and Melody think and do to be patently ridiculous. So from here, we move into answer territory. I knew the narrative was going to tie the fake commercial in somehow, but I definitely didn't think it would be so soon. It turns out that Virgil's company created Wellspring, that DNA testing service from the opening, except that he ended up shutting it down when various law enforcement agencies wanted to use it to help solve crimes. Because, yeah, God forbid we start putting away actual murderers and rapists instead of ruining lives over weed and petty theft and nonsense like that. <sighs> Given that I'm still waffling on whether I think we're doing demon stuff here or alien stuff, I have to wonder if this addition of DNA testing into the story is going to bring in some kind of star child nonsense. Like, what's the clandestine point of DNA testing insofar as it relates to this cult and conspiracy? Are they testing to try to find a specific bloodline? To try to find specific people, maybe? Possibly for breeding? How could DNA testing possibly play into this, especially with the added context of the service having been shut down at some point in the past? Supposedly. From there, Virgil insists that he doesn't actually know what is on the tapes, nor did he know that Dan's father was involved, not for sure. And he reverse psychologies Dan into staying here to continue restoring the tapes, part of which is essentially calling him a chicken, and part of which is revealing to him that an inquiry had been opened into Dan's father at the university where he worked. The letter is dated a few days after Melody's footage, so there's definitely a connection, though it's not guaranteed that Melody was the one who filed the complaint. Back to the tapes. Melody wakes to hear the chanting again, and this time she goes to investigate. She doesn't bring Annabelle, which is stupid from a you-should-have-backup perspective, but bright from an Annabelle-would-be-even-worse-than-nothing perspective. Taking her camera downstairs with her to poke around, because of course she does, Melody spies on the building community room while some kind of a pagan religious service goes on. There's an altar at the center of the room, whereupon sits a statue with a very distinctive head shape, and I've gotta say that I found the sight of it hilarious. I need you, right now, to go to Google Images, assuming you're not driving or something, and type in the phrase Scooby-Doo Aliens into the search box. The green fuckers that come up? The ones with the crazy head and the red eyes? Yeah, those bastards are all I can see when I look at this statue, and it makes me want to laugh my whole ass off. The rest of the scene, though, is less funny. All of the building's shiftiest characters are here doing something. They're like humming and moaning and breathing in little synchronized gasps, with the exception of Mrs. Wall or Hall or whatever her name was. And I hated every moment of it. Notable, of course, is that both Tamara and Samuel are here, and that Samuel appears to be a leader of some kind for this group of weirdos. Melody hides in the closet until everyone leaves, which is kind of on the nose, considering I think she was sapphic in the original podcast and then has to hide once again when Tamara and Samuel come in and I guess they start fucking. They're like really enjoying themselves for two people who don't seem to have taken any clothes off and only touch for like a minute at the most. They're moaning and groaning and then they're fucking growling and I haven't seen either one of them do anything anywhere near interesting enough to warrant all of that. So, okay. 
whatever they're doing, Dan gets hit with another surge of audio feedback as they finish up and go their separate ways, and I've really got to repeat that there is no way Tamara could have gotten literally anything out of that split-second encounter. And then, Melody heads back upstairs to tell Annabelle very vaguely about what's going on. Annabelle at first suggests that they leave, to which I say good, finally, thank you, and then changes her tune after hearing that Melody is looking for her birth mom. I kind of wonder if this might not be a trap or a lure or something, given that there's no real indication that Julia Bent is actually at this building or still alive or anything. There's not even any proof that Julia Bennett was the one who wrote the letter asking about Melody. If anything, I would guess that the creepy cheek kisser, Miss Wall, is the one who wrote that letter, and that Melody is just going to be the latest in a long line of victims, a line that will likely include Beatrice before it includes Melody. But then comes the knock on Melody's door. Annabelle warns her not to answer, and I gotta wonder if that means something significant. But Melody goes anyway. She opens the door, and no one is there, but it is unmistakable. This is the moment from earlier, the equal and opposite moment to what Dan dreamed. Finally, Dan leaves the compound. He meets up with Mark in the nearest town, and he passes Mark a note with the word Kalego written on it. It's the only thing he thought he could vaguely make out from the spooky chant, and I've gotta ask, if Dan can ride his bike to town to meet up with his friend to get information, why can't Dan ride his bike to town to look up shit for himself? Does he not own a laptop? Can his friend not bring him a laptop? I get that this is a podcast trope. The protagonist is never the research guy. There's always an investigator on the ground, an investigator with personality and then there's the technical investigator who is off screen more or less. Every Alex has a Nick, every Nick has an MK, but this isn't a podcast and we can leave that trope behind. Dan can do his own investigating. He doesn't have to foist the process off on Mark. I can only hope that something interesting will come of this degree of separation happening here because right now it just feels like jumping through hoops to preserve a podcast trope across media. And speaking of podcast tropes, this LMG shit has podcast stamped all over it. A super secret, no one's ever heard of the mega corporation with their tendrils reaching into every conceivable industry? I can literally hear Christine Kofsky in my head delivering Mark's lines, along with Terry Miles delivering Dan's. It was like a horrible little tennis flashback happening entirely within my head, and I think I'm owed compensation for that emotional damage, thank you very much. Speaking of emotional damage, though, Mark has gotten his hands on recordings of Melody's therapy sessions, and holy fuck, is that illegal? Listening to someone's therapy sessions without their consent is one of the most unethical things I can imagine. Except, you know, actually being someone's therapist and then fucking them. Gross. Anyway, Mark has one last bit of interesting news, and I find it hilariously ridiculous that he waited until the end of this conversation to drop this little tidbit. Again, it is such podcast writing. I guarantee that this is a cliffhanger they are carrying over from an episode of the original podcast because the reveal here is a juicy one. And fuck it if it doesn't make a ton of sense for the conversation to unfold this way, because gimme that drama. Melody Pendress, according to Mark, is still alive. She did not die in the fire. She's actually in Pittsburgh. So why doesn't Dan just ask her about all of this himself? Cut to the credits. So all in all, this is not an atrocious opening to a show. I am not, you know, extraordinarily impressed. I'm not, honestly, largely impressed. But it's not awful. There's a lot to nitpick. There's a lot to generally complain about. I wouldn't even call it nitpicking. But there is promise. There's promise. There are tropes here that I am enjoying nestled in with the tropes that I do not enjoy. It is, it has a certain, you know, 2014 charm to it. It really does feel like a throwback to, you know, some of the worst parts of Tannis and the Black Tapes. And I'm hoping as it unfolds that it will instead veer more towards the good parts of the Black Tapes and Tannis. Um, you know, as I keep implying, those were very interesting stories that devolved into nothingness, and perhaps this will amend that. Perhaps this can be the thing that fills that gap. But I, like I said, am not largely optimistic. This does not seem to be extraordinarily well done based off of these two episodes, and I am hoping that the unfolding of the plot will make up for the, the lack in characterization and at certain points acting. I don't know if that's actually going to happen, but again, that is my hope. All in all, though, even if it's bad, it's only eight episodes. I don't know for sure if this show is going to be getting a second season. I know it has been hitting those, you know, top 10 on Netflix right now lists, but Netflix has a penchant for canceling things. As of the time that I'm recording this, the show has not yet been canceled, but 
like I said, Netflix cancels things as easily as they breathe. So who knows? By the time you're hearing this, the show could be canceled. Who knows? So with all of that said, I am looking forward in a certain, I don't know, couched way. I am cautiously optimistic about the rest of this series and i'm going to be back next week with my coverage of episode three and episode four i hope that you will be back to join me for that if you are interested in my reaction videos to those two episodes or these first two episodes or anything else i have covered for the podcast or other shows including midnight mass blind manor squid game and plenty more you may be interested in joining my five dollar patreon tier where you will get all of my full-length reaction videos Alternately, $1 and up patrons help me decide what it is that I'm going to be watching when I don't already have something in mind. Uh, speaking of things in my mind, Stranger Things 4 is going to be coming out soon, as is Umbrella Academy Season 3 and Russian Doll Season 2. So if you are interested in reaction videos or helping point me towards other good things to watch, head to the Patreon. If you are not interested in either of those things, I would appreciate a rating or a review on your podcatcher of choice. Please be honest in your feedback. I genuinely don't care. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Um, alternately, you could recommend the show to a friend or talk about it on social media. Anything helps. It's all very much appreciated. And if you are not interested in doing literally any of that, that is perfectly fine. All I ask is that you keep coming back and listening for as long as you're actually enjoying the show. So, like I said, I will be back next week with my next coverage of Archive 81, and I hope you will join me again then. As always, thank you so much for listening.